Where are you going to go, man? Where are you going to go? Go to the Savior. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, please. 1 Corinthians 14. First Corinthians 14. Famous chapter, if, you're, when you read and, if and when you read through your Bible, you should probably read, I would suggest you should read, 12, 13, and 14 together, only because that's the summation of the gifts in particular in one lump. I, I know they're over in Romans chapter number 12 as well, and Ephesians 4, but this is where most of the goofy churches like to teach you, or take you to teach you, that you can, you know, speak in tongues and all that stuff. Uh, first of all, tongues are a language, either not known to the speaker or not known to the hearer. That's new tongues, unknown tongues, and all those things. They never give you all that information. But uh, what's done today in the name of tongues is absolutely out of the pit of hell. Well, what about my feelings? I don't care about your feelings. What's the Word of God say? Uh, your feelings, your experience. Well, I was just so overcome I had to say it. No, you'd be better off not saying it. Okay? So we're not going to hit on that. We're not, that would be easy to speak on tongues. Say, because nobody speaks in tongues. Say, except for the Spanish contingent from Guatemala or wherever, they're, <laughs> where, 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 wherever you're from. I don't know. But that would be easy, you know, well, well no, we, we got some more fun this morning yeah. on ignorance. Be good for you, man. Bible says this in verse 14. Verse 20, Estella just looked at me and she's like, I'm not, this is why I don't come. I don't like you, 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 you blanco loco. I don't like you. Verse number 27 says this, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, not a whole church gabbling and gobbling like a bunch of pigeons. That's what they do. You know, oh, what'd you say? Oh, I don't know. I just, the Spirit came over me. Yeah, not the Spirit of the Lord. And that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. I wonder if they ever read that. And let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that seeth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You see, that's a little less there, don't you? Don't tell me you just got so overwhelmed you had to curse, swear, lose your temper and all that stuff. No, you do have some control over that spirit that's in you. Uh, what's weird about this? I'm not preaching on tongues this morning, but you know what's interesting about this whole chapter, chapter 14, where people like to tell you and say it's a heavenly language and, well, and God understands all that? Find me one capital S in the whole chapter. And, I, I, and I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you uh, Justin's car if you, if you can do that, man. <laughs> trust me, it's not there. You can do, well, don't trust me. Go look it up yourself. The Bible says this, verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches. Men, 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 where are you? Men, amen. Jonathan, you better buck up right there, buddy. Now, the context is tongues. Because you know in other places, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And women can teach children, and they're supposed to teach other women. Okay, let's move on. For it is not, all right, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. Well, well in the passage, it's talking about tongues and ought to be in, being out of order. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Well, my wife knows the Bible. She's the one that goes to church. No, stupid. You're supposed to be the one that's supposed to know it, and you're supposed to be able to teach your wife the Word of God. Bible says, I'm, I'm just getting into this. It's just some, you know, Guido, the purple set me right off, man. It just, you know, I'm, I was, I, I, you know, I, the color's just, the color's a little rainbow. Just set me off, man. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for a woman to speak at the, in, in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. That's from the Apostle Paul. Give it to him by the Holy Ghost. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forget, forbid not to speak with tongues, that all things be done decently and in order. Father, thank you again for this Bible you've given to us. Thank you for the Spirit of God. Thank you for our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you for the shed blood. Thank you for the promise, the eternal promise of eternal life through that shed blood. And I know that, Father, because you put it in your book. And I believe your book, Father. And I pray today you'd help me to preach this book through the power of the Spirit of God. In fact, you just preached through me to help my brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we're not supposed to be ignorant. It's, just, it's laid out in so many places. We're not supposed to be unlearned about these things. And I pray today after you deal with us that we would not be ignorant. 
of some things that are just very plain laid out for us in the scriptures. We thank you again for your soon coming. Thank you for everything that you have for us in this book. Please help us, Father, to have ears to hear and hearts to understand today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Uh, what a time. We, you can be seated. What a time you live in. I mean, honestly, where in the history of mankind would you ever think you could have so much knowledge at your hand? I mean, seriously, the amount of RAM and the amount of processing power you have in your computer is more than they had to launch the first rocket. It's sick. The amount of gigabytes and all that stuff you have in that little five to six inch screen that you carry around in your mitt, the amount of, the amount of access to information you have is, is unbelievable. I mean, what do people say when they don't know something nowadays? I Google it. You know, I, how about you go read a book? You know, when I was growing up, I know it was a long time ago and whatever. I read encyclopedias as a kid. That's my nerd spot for the day. I read encyclopedias as a kid. If I was, we weren't playing sports, I wouldn't, you know, because video games weren't out yet, so I didn't have to sit there and destroy my thumbs. You know, Atari was the coolest thing going back in the day, you know, with the joystick and little block men moving around really slow. You know, all for those days, instead of having pornography and naked women on video games. But now you have a phone and... I can Google something now instead of reading it. Or I can, I, you know, it's amazing how much data and information is available and how ignorant people are. And I can understand it amongst lost people that they're ignorant and don't know and unlearned. But for saved people to be ignorant about the things contained in that book, that's what really freaks me out. But you know what's interesting? What you just read in that passage in the midst of tongues and how God's saying this is how we do tongues and this if you're going to do tongues, then well, that, that's cool and let all things be done decently in order. You know what he sandwiched right in there? If you want to be ignorant, just be ignorant. Our brother Guido has a saying that uh, people are going to die from terminal ignorance. But you know what's weird in the Old Testament? Ignorance didn't mean you escaped the judgment of God or that you didn't have to be aware of what God required of you. If you just did it, you know, like the Apostle Paul says, I did things ignorantly and in unbelief. But when I met that Savior on the road, I immediately said, that's it. That's what I've been looking for all my life. You can be ignorant, but when you're presented with the truth, you better take that truth. Because ignorance is no like, oh, I didn't know there's a judgment seat of Christ. Oh, I didn't know I was supposed to know what was in the Bible. I didn't know you were coming for me in the clouds. I didn't know I was supposed to hand out tracts. That is not going to get you by in front of our Savior. Well, I'm just going to claim ignorance. And oh, you know, oh, oh, oh if ignorance is bliss, I'm in a blizzard. Ha, 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 ha. No, you don't get around that stuff, man. You don't get around that stuff. And particularly, the apostle God gave to you and I from Rhones of Philemon, that's where you find the bulk of, I'm going to use the big word, this is for Sister Kathleen, the preponderance. That's a phenomenal word. You're all going, let me Google that right now so I'm not, so I'm not ignorant. Preponderance. That, come on, man, that's a great word, man. Convolvolusis, verisimilitude. Oh, man, forget it. You, what an ignorant lot. <laughs> but I'm saying when you, when you get into this Bible, the ignorance is primarily to believers, do you know that we are very ignorant as, child, as children to God? We're, we, are, we are very unlearned. And as Laban said, if we do know some facts about something, we don't get any experience with the data. So what I'm going here this morning is, again, you know this, it's not about head knowledge. You've got to have that knowledge and not be ignorant, but then you've got to put that thing into practice. Laban, who is just a, a horrible human being that God used to teach Jacob a lesson about himself, Laban said, I've learned by experience in Genesis chapter 30. You do learn things by experience. There's things that facts can give you, but it's facts plus you've got to live some life before you really understand what that knowledge means. I'll show you some things this morning, Lord, one about, about things that you and I as believers should not be ignorant of. Now, I'm going to go to the Old Testament to start with, so I ruined your whole day about being in the Pauline epistles, but I've got to set the stage. Psalm 73, please. We're not going to run all the verses. It's not a word study, but last week we had, we had expositional. We've, we've preached through whole chapters. We've preached through whole books. We've done multiple things. It's just the way the Lord would have us to do it. This is not a word study, but it is taking the way God uses a particular word or phrase and how he lays it out. You heard in Sunday school about the law of first mention. There's the law of first mention in your King James Bible. Then there's the law of following 
mention, and then there's the law of final mention. So God establishes a precedent with his first use of a word, and then you watch how it plays out as God uses it in different contexts, different books, different epistles, different people he deals with, and then you watch how he uses it finally. Like, what's the last word of a King James Bible? Amen. Know what's the cool thing? Go back and look at what amen means. It's a worship and praise to your Heavenly Father. You don't just say it, amen and everything. It's not a say amen right there. Maybe it's not worth saying amen to. Maybe you let the Holy Ghost tell you when to say amen. I mean, God forbid you let him do that for you. You don't just throw out amens, man. I mean, even on the street when we're talking to people, there are, you, can, you talk to them, they're lost, but they're, you say about the Lord Jesus Christ, they go, amen right there. Well, maybe they're giving praise to God as a lost person until they get saved and start doing it the right way. So I want to show you something in Psalm 73 as we get started here. Psalm 73. David is a man after God's own heart. But uh, this boy, boy, he had, he's quite the life, man, with the God of the Old Testament, man. 73.1 says this, uh, the title says, A Psalm of Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as of clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the fools when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble. That's the wicked the, in the, in the fool, uh, the, the, the people that know not God. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain, and violence covereth them as a, gar as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my hand. Uh, this is what, now look at what David says about the wicked and the ungodly. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. For I say, uh, uh, if I say, I will speak thus, behold, I should defend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Surely they did set them. Uh, uh, surely they did set them in slippery places. Thou cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awaketh. So, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus was my heart grieved. And I was pricked in my reins. That's his heart reins. That's Jeremiah 17, 10. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. I'd like to start off as we get going this morning. You know what you can be ignorant of, brother, sister in Christ? You can be ignorant of how great your salvation really is. You can be ignorant of just how deep in the mire you were when God reached his salvation hand down through the blood of his son and rescued you. Hell's a joke today, folks, to people because they've watched too much, too much YouTube and unHollywood garbage and they think hell's a great place where their friends are and their buddies are and the booze is better and it's, not, it's just a great time down there and everybody thinks hell's great. David said, you know what? I thought the life that the wicked were living was great until I walked into the sanctuary of God and I said, that's their end. Do you know what the first thing you saw when you walked in that path was? A five-by-five five altar of brass that burned with fire. You know what the end of everybody is that rejects Jesus Christ? Eternal fire. I know David's not a saved man. I know David's not a New Testament Christian. I know he's not in the body of Christ. I understand that. But the picture is, he goes, you know what? I was thinking they had it better than me. I was thinking the wicked had a better life. They're never hurt. They're never chastened. They don't suffer any plagues. They don't get hurt. They don't, they don't have... It just seems like the wicked have it smooth until they die without Christ. Now, I'm not sitting here going, ha, 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 you're going to hell. No, I'm trying to pull them out of the fire, man. But if you want to go that way and you want to die and burn forever, you as a saved person need to know that's their choice as a lost person. But don't you ever think their life is better than yours. You're living the short game, brother. You need to see eternally that your end is far better than theirs. But you're ignorant of that. You know why you're ignorant? You're not in that book. You know why you're, you're, you're ignorant of the fact that you and Christ are so far greater and have so far greater than the lost people? because you're not in that Bible consistently and you're not praying consistently. So when you look at the Bill Gateses and the, and the people with the money and, the, and all this, and you go, oh man, I wish to God I could. You wish to God you could join them in health and never get saved? 
David, David's a king, man. He's got everything at his disposal. He's wiped out all his enemies. And he goes, you know what? You know what that kind of thinking is like? It's ignorant and you become like an animal. You start thinking like an animal when you sit there and think the lost have it better than you do. Do you think Paul would trade his 195 stripes? You think Paul would trade his shipwreck? You think Paul would trade in his hungrings and his friends leaving him to go to hell? The only thing he said to go to hell for was if all Israel got saved. I don't have that in me. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that spirit-filled, man. I wouldn't give up my salvation for anything. But you act like you don't have it. You're ignorant of it sometimes. I get that way too. I do. I think God shortchanged me sometimes. I mean, we'd never voice that with our, with our mouths because that would then beray what's in our heart. But sometimes I look at folks that don't have any troubles and they don't have any problems and things just appear to go swimmingly for them down the road. And I'm like, man, I didn't know getting saved involved all this pain, sorrow, and friends leaving and heartache and headache and death. I didn't know this was going to happen. I mean, honestly, if you knew what God had laid out for you ahead of time, would you still get saved? I mean, you'll say it because you want to get out of hell, and I, I agree with that. I, I, I got saved because I didn't want to burn forever. Let's just be brutally honest about it. I didn't save because I wanted to tithe. I didn't save because I wanted to hang around you fine folks. I got saved because I... Yeah, I'm sorry, Paul. I don't want to ruin your whole life, man. I got saved because I didn't want to roast like a chicken forever. A big, monstrous chicken with no feathers that walk through my yard that I hate every day. But anyway... Those things are going to haunt me. I'll probably have to run, I'll have to probably run a chicken farm in the millennial kingdom. That's, my, that's going to be my gig. But sometimes you get bogged down looking at the world and saying, wow, what, why is this happening to me and not that? Because you're God's child, that's why. And he's making you like him through his son. You know who they're becoming like? Their father, the devil. I wish to God they'd get saved. I really do. I don't, I don't give my life. I give my life for 35 years to witness in the hundreds of thousands of people because I want to see them go to hell. I'm not doing it because of some religious exercise. That would have quit a long time ago if that was the case. I do it because I want to see them get saved. But you know what? At the end of it all, if they reject Christ, I'm not going to sit there and go, wow, I wish I had a better life than them. No, man, I'm looking for the eternal game. Don't be ignorant in this one thing right off the bat. You've got it so much better than a lost person. I don't care if... If you, if you could swap places with the richest man in the world, if he's lost without Christ, you're far better in Christ. But that's not the way it is today in our churches. Even in our churches, all materialism and show me and, you know, Jesus is in the corner just sitting waiting for his turn. And every, it's all about everybody else. It's, 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 it's crept into our churches for the last 10, 20 years too, where the Lord is a, a bystander to what we do. No, thank God for him, and he has the preeminence, and he gets the place, and he gets to do whatever he wants, because it's his church. But I don't want to be ignorant of the fact of what he saved me from. Do you know you went from darkness to light when he saved you? Do you know what from Satan to God? Do you know what he really did for you? We got so used to being saved, it's just like, I'm saved. Yeah. When you see that lake of fire, you're going to go, thank you, God, I'm not there. I can't, a lake that burns with fire. What an oxymoron. God is so smart. A lake that burns with fire. Only God can do it. The nations are less than nothing. God's got all kinds of oxymorons. I mean, we got a church full of oxymorons led by the head oxymoron. Well, are you calling me a bad name? No, it's an oxymoron like jumbo shrimp. You know, metal wood. I'm smart. That's stuff like that. That's an, that's an oxymoron. All right, all right, Romans chapter number 10. Paul likes that. He's like, oh, no, now you're hitting the buttons, man. I like that. <laughs> ignorant, man. People think ignorant means stupid. No, no, man. I does, that's not necessarily the case. Ignorant means you just don't know. You're, you're unlearned. But it also has to do with you're not putting into practice what you do know. You're just, what's the base word for ignorant? Uh, a guy told me on... Uh, at the Yard Goats on Thursday. It was just a re re regular guy come up to the street corner and went to hand track. And he, he wasn't being sarcastic at all. Um, he goes, no, not today. He's ignorant thinking he's got tomorrow. 
He just doesn't know. He wasn't mean. He wasn't crass. He wasn't wicked. He wasn't, he wasn't, uh, uh, he wasn't Nabal. He wasn't churlish. He was just like, not today. I said, well, the Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And he said something I, you know, because I'm of a very gregarious person, Guido, as you know. Yeah, okay, gregarious preponderance. I lost you guys a long time ago, man. But when you, and he says something, I said something funny. He starts laughing. I said, see, not just another pretty face telling you about Jesus. Just trying to talk to him a little bit, you know? He wouldn't take the track, but his thought was, you know what? I've got tomorrow. I've got 10 years from now. There's nothing wrong with putting some money away and all that stuff. But thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. You have no idea when that breath goes out, that aneurysm hits. You have no idea. None of us do. Shouldn't be ignorant of that thing, man. Because that fire is awaiting the lost. But look what the Bible says over here in Romans chapter number 10. We're building a couple things regarding the lost, but I also wanted to call your attention to that first one, that saved people can think like that too. Look at verse number 1. Romans 10.1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You know what people are ignorant of today? They're ignorant of the fact that God no longer will accept any of your works. Now, Brother Guido taught in Sunday school this morning. He was taking you forward that this, the blood and all that stuff, and it should have been a blood, blood offering. But the reality is, is that if he did what was right, what God said, God would have accepted it. That was the question. If you do well, it'll be, God will take care of you. But once Jesus Christ shows up and fulfills all the law, every jot, every tittle, guess what? Look what I did, Lord's off the table. Look what I made you today, Lord. That's off the table. Look what church I go to, Lord. Off the table. Look how many good works and how, many, much, much, um, uh, how much money I give. Off the table. You know why? Because somebody holy, perfect, and sinless showed up and made it through life untainted by sin. It's over now. You want to have your own righteousness? You lose. You want to have Cain's religion? You're out. You've got to take the righteousness God said to have today through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now you say, well, what's the application for me? It's talk, so talking a little bit about lost people this morning, preacher. Don't you think that handing out tracts stuff makes you more righteous than you already are? Do you know that you're as righteous as you can be through Jesus Christ? We've been studying Galatians on Sunday night. What's the battle going on in Galatia? I can do something in my flesh to make God accept me more than he already accepts me in Jesus Christ. Should you do good works after you're saved for the judgment seat? Sure you should. But those good works will not make you have a closer walk with Jesus Christ. You can hand out tracts and just be so full of the devil and so full of wickedness and your mind be somewhere else. You can do that. You know why? Because I've done it. You can be so distracted and so far away from when you read your Bible, but you've got to read your Bible because you've got to check it out the box and that idiot's going to say something on Sunday morning about reading my Bible. Why don't you get your heart right before you do that? You're not adding anything to the righteousness God gave to you through Jesus Christ by doing anything. Everything we do now is to make you and me more like Jesus Christ. And yes, it's going to stack up at the judgment seat of Christ. But you can't tell me those ladies I spent, and I keep bringing on it, because you can't tell me ladies like Marge and Kathy, who Kathy has never spoke, but she said a lot. Well, how are you going to stack up to that one day? Well, she didn't go out on the street as much as I did, and she didn't give as much money as I did, and she didn't. Oh, you fool. You're ignorant, buddy. Because you think you're going to add something to God's righteousness through Jesus Christ? No. It's to make me more like the Savior and to be conformed to His image. But you heard this morning in Sunday school, what do people say now when you go to Hammond Track? I'm all set. I'm all good. Now, I know what they're saying when they say that. They think I'm handing them a coupon book for car washes. They think I'm selling them something. They're ignorant of that. But when you get... When you, <laughs> what they're really saying when they say I'm all set is, if there is a God out there, and if there is an eternity out there, I'm not really sure about that. I got it covered anyway, because you know what? I'm a pretty sparkling individual. Well, you are when you compare yourself to somebody else, but you're not when you compare yourself to someone that's sinless. God just told you right there, don't be ignorant. The stature and the, the height of righteousness is my son. Uh, let me ask you a question. Have you committed a sin in the last hour? Don't raise your hand. A sin in word, thought, or deed. Did you know what, whatsoever is not a faith is sin? Did you do something in the last hour that you didn't trust God for in your heart and your mind? 
That's sin. Did you know the thought of foolishness is sin? Did you think of anything foolish in the last hour? Well, what would you do if your righteousness was based on your own self? You'd be in trouble. I'm not excusing carnal, filthy living. You know that. What I'm saying to you is that be careful not to try to add something to what's already been done and complete by your Savior. You'll get so frustrated, you'll stop. It's the dress code. It's the glasses code. It's the how many kids code. It's the, it's the uh, it's, uh, Benny hiding behind the partition code. It's, it's, what, it's whatever it is. It's do you homeschool? Do you don't homeschool? What has that got to do with your life in Christ? It's just man's rules on you to make you... No, the Holy Ghost makes you more like Christ through that book. D don't be ignorant. You know what? You're just ignorant. I take offense to that. Well, don't be ignorant. Instead of taking the rebuke and going doing something about your ignorance, you just stay ignorant. What, what, where do we start in 1 Corinthians 14? You want to be ignorant? I'm sure what I've preached in the last two years and last, for the last 35 years, whether it's, <laughs> what, I'm sure it's like, pfft, whatever. You could have said it about Sunday school or any of the Sunday schools the men have taught in the last uh, eight to ten weeks, and you just blow it off and, oh, okay, okay. You want to be ignorant? Just keep being ignorant. Well, I'm not ignorant. You, you, you are. Because you're kicking against God's word and what he said. You know what? You want to be ignorant? Just, you know what? Just stay. You know what? Stay the way you are, and when you meet God, tell him about your ignorance. Oh, Lord, I was just ignorant. Uh, let's see. Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy, uh, uh, thir uh, I'm gonna, Deuteronomy 14, uh, Numbers 5. I went through a bunch of them. I just had to rehearse and go through it. I already studied that years ago, but yeah, ignorance is not an excuse. Not going to get away. Why? I just didn't know that. You know what my question is? Why didn't you know that? Why do you know the Bible like that? Because I avail myself of the Bible. Can't you? Can't you read it through? Can't you study it? Can't you say, Lord, you know what? I'd like to learn some of this stuff. He will, he'll give it to you, man. He'll give it to you in a way you can't even believe. You'll just read it and you'll be like, man, I can't get through this chapter. He's just giving... Well, just, you want to be ignorant? Be ignorant. And my preacher believes that. What do you believe? You're ignorant, brother. You're ignorant, sister. When you, should, when you shouldn't be. Go with me back uh, to Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter 1. I'm going backwards, Justin, so don't yell at me, please. <laughs> Romans 1. Romans 1. Romans 1, verse number 1 says this, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had uh, promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith, uh, to the faith among all nations, for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I may make mention of you, uh, make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. That's, that's your traveling mercies prayer right there. For I, see, for I long to seek you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established, that that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that I oftentimes, uh, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that means prevent in that case, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. You know what I don't want you to be ignorant of this morning and that you should not be ignorant of according to God's word in the Pauline epistles? Don't be ignorant that what you do should produce fruit. I don't want to do anything for the Lord that is just stagnant. You know what grows in stagnant water? Take a good whiff of a nice pond that doesn't have clear flowing water in and out. Egress and ingress. What, what gets bred in stagnant water? Mosquitoes, larvae. Stink, algae. It's just horrific, man. I cleaned out my gutters yesterday on one side of the house. Our gutters, I've taken down every tree. It looks like the tribulation period. I just don't, don't want to deal with leaves anymore. But on this one side, of course, 
this one gutter gets, you know, like the random, you know, two or three seeds, and then it grows into a palm tree in my stinking gutter. So I'm up there. With, it's not funny, Jennifer. And I get up there because I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to fall. My neighbor's laughing at me. I'm going to fall again. And I said, well, stop laughing at me, Mo, and get over here. And not the, so the other Mo, not the Mo. It's another Mo. Comes over. I said, hold the ladder for me. So I get up there and clean it out, man. And got that thing flowing again, man. I, you, you want your life to, you want some fruit in your life and that fruit to remain for all eternity. Didn't Jesus Christ say in John 15, 16, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you? That she should do what? Go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. I don't want to just do things for the sake of doing them. I want them to have some purpose for the Lord God Almighty that will, re, will resound and redound to the thanksgiving God in all eternity. Do you understand what we do is for eternity, folks? That when you hand out a gospel tract, when you give some money to missionaries, when it, it has an effect in eternity. And Paul says, I don't want you ignorant that I'm not just traveling around for the sake of traveling around. I'm not getting on a boat and in danger of shipwreck and pirates and getting robbed and everything. I'm getting on a boat so that I can invest in you so that you might have fruit that lasts forever and that you might be my fruit. I didn't go to jail for 70 and a half years just to go to jail. Do you think I went for 70 and a half years to spend time with Guido? And he didn't do the same for me. We did it so it has an impact in people's lives and for the glory of Jesus Christ for all eternity. I want to see those guys in glory. I want to see those guys in the judgment seat of Christ and have a good report. And That's what we're doing. It's not like last week we saw in Jeremiah, I said, oh, let's just go to church. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Eh, you know, we'll, yeah, we'll just clean up once a week. No. This has eternity written all over it. You want fruit that not is just fruit. You want fruit that remains. You go over to 2 Peter, and we will not turn there, but you know why people are unfruitful? Because they don't remember what they were purged from, and they don't grow, and they don't add to their faith temperance and charity and all those things. They just, because they don't, well, I'm saved for eternity, but nothing I do matters for eternity. Oh, you're dead wrong. This whole thing, man, is going to reflect over into eternity. It's 2 Peter 1, ask the if you're turning for the cross reference. That's the benefit of me sitting here and seeing you guys. I'm like, and being tall, I'm like, oh, yeah. It's 2 Peter chapter 1 is the one if you, you don't want to be unfruitful. I want, I want, folks, I don't want to meet on Sundays and Wednesdays and go on the street and go to jail and go to nursing homes. I don't want to do it just for the sake of checking off the box so I can be a good Baptist. I could care less about being a good Baptist. I want to be a good child of God that has eternal consequences in people's lives out, out in the future. 100%. You know why? Because somebody did it for me. Amen. Somebody did it for me. Somebody invested in my life and said, you know what, I don't know what's going to turn out, but I'll invest in his life. That, that's what we're supposed to do for one another. I, honestly, fishermen, tax collectors, and knuckleheads. That's what the 12 were made up of. And you know why you're here today? You're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. You're here because those knuckleheads listened to their Savior. You don't think that was fruitful? You're saved because of that ministry somewhere down the road. My brother led me to Christ. Well, who led him to Christ? Who led that person to Christ that led that person to Christ that led my... You sit there and you, you, you got to think this thing through, man. You're here because somebody invested in somebody who invested in somebody who invested in somebody, and now you get that benefit of a King James Bible in your lap and somebody teaching you the Word of God. You ought to be thankful for that, but don't be ignorant, man. What you do has fruitful consequences or unfruitful consequences out in eternity. Romans chapter 11. Brother, Brother Bird's ticked off. I'm going all through the Pauline epistles. He's, he probably can hear this over in Ledyard. <laughs> Romans 11. Be sure I'll rub it into him. I'm sure Jennifer and John, Jonathan and Jennifer are going to rub it into him. Say, he was on the Pauline epistles today. Look what you missed. Or maybe they won't say it like that, but it'll be something similar. Romans 11. Romans 11. Verse 25 says this. Romans 11, 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. That's physical salvation, the second coming. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. That's national. That's national for the nation of Israel. But you know what he snuck in there? I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. You know what you're supposed to be a steward of? If you're supposed to be a steward of anything, the mysteries, particularly Romans the Philemon. You know what the mystery is right here that you shouldn't be ignorant of? God's not done with Israel. 
You say, well, what's that got to do with me today? Is there not a satanic, filthy doctrine going through our churches that you're going through the tribulation period? Isn't, aren't they regurgitating what actually 2 Timothy 2? Didn't those boys say you've missed the resurrection and you're, you're hosed? Didn't Paul warn in 2 Thessalonians that I don't care if we say it or you heard we said it or you get an epistle. If God didn't tell you, you're not going through it. You didn't miss the day of Christ. Get over it. You know why I know that COVID is not some plague from uh, Revelation? You know why I know the shot is not the mark of the beast? I'm still here. The body of Christ gets called out. The dead in Christ, we'll get to that in a little bit. You know why I'm, because I'm still here. I'm not Israel. And neither are you. You're a child of God. Jew, Gentile, Church of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 32. You, ne you can't forget that. Don't be ignorant. You're not Israel. Now, if you run some fine folks on the street that think they're the nation of Islam or nation of Israel or whatever, how about your soul? There was a guy that years ago on the street in Hartford, he'd just come up, man, and just, I mean, curse a blue streak, man, and just go off the wall. And then he'd get into this whole diatribe about, you know, I'm a black Hebrew Israelite, and blah, 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 blah. And I happened to be across the street at this time in the gold building, so I was watching a couple of the other brothers deal with them, and then I kind of got the... Uh, uh, I got the high sign because <laughs> this is what he used to do. Harry, Harry would go, he'd be like, <laughs> he's like, been a key, been a key. He's like, Scream. <laughs> I knew what he meant, man. We spoke in tongues. I knew what he meant. <laughs> so I, I'm looking over because I can see this guy jibber jabbering with the other guys. Jibber jabber, that's a word. Go look it up. It's an Ebonic Bible. You go look up jibber jab. But anyway, Harry's calling me up, so I get over there. And this guy is just arguing his head off about nation of Israel, and I'm a black Hebrew Israelite, and nobody cares, and you're spreading white man's religion. I'm like, Jesus Christ is a Shemitic Judaic Jew. He's yellow. But they don't know that. You can't argue with that unlearned because he's ignorant. So I just walked up to him casually. as you know, they're, I said, sir, do you have a second? He goes, what? I said, I'd like to just ask you one question, then I'm going to go back on the other side of the street. I said, could you just tell me what the color of your skin is? I mean, the color of your soul is. That's what we call a mic drop moment. You know why? Because who cares what skin color you are when you lose your soul to a devil's hell? This ain't national. This ain't... This. Listen, don't be ignorant. God, God is going to deal with Israel. But you need to preach the gospel, the grace of God, where anybody and everybody can get saved. I don't care what creed, race, whatever. You can get saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. But don't be ignorant that God's not done with Israel. You do not replace Israel. Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 17, 19, 21 have nothing to do with you other than reading and saying, thank God I'm not going to be here for that stuff. I have to keep bringing that up because this knucklehead, and his name is Stephen Anderson. I'm not afraid to say it like, oh, that guy. No, his name is Stephen Anderson. He's a knucklehead loser. And you can put that out. I don't care if he's my brother in Christ or not. He's a loser. You know what this guy does? He sends his little acolytes to churches to try and pin Christians down and get them to get in arguments with them about tribulation. Don't you have something better to do like go win people to Christ? He'll film debates. He'll send people to churches. I'm sure some people will come up. Well, they probably won't come on this door. But they'll, 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 they're sure they'll make, they'll make their way around here. When, uh, you ever seen what's in Matthew 24? Yeah, I, I have like 150 times. That's nothing to do with me and you. It, you know what? You know what? You, we know what they're trying to do. They're trying to replace the nation of Israel. You're not the nation of Israel. Second Chronicles 7:14. If my people were to call by name, you're not called by his name. There's no national revival. It's saved people getting right with the Lord and living for Jesus Christ. No na the only national revival is the second coming. It involves Israel. You just read it. But you know what? People are ignorant of that stuff. And now because it's hard to win people to Christ and it's hard to get the gospel out and people are more cold and people are more hard and more people in their lives and their phones and their media and all that stuff, it's harder to win people to Christ. I agree with you. So now we just shift the script and say, well, let's go back to physical blessings and you know, cars and money. No, you're not Israel, man. But you're ignorant of that. Unlearned. Can't tell the difference between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and you as a child of God in Christ. You're ignorant of it. I, I'm not saying that you, and that I think we're very well learned in this church, but I'm just reminding you this morning, don't be ignorant of this stuff. You know why? Because the Bible says don't be ignorant. It's, listen, it's not enough just to witness. You need to know that book in a way that involves experience in your life so that book becomes real to you personally. 
First Corinthians chapter number 10. First Corinthians 10. First Corinthians 10. First Corinthians 10. We've often equated ignorance, as I said before, with stupidity and just, no, you're just unlearned, don't know. But it's further than that because you won't, if you do know it, you won't do anything with it. Look at the Bible says to me in 1 Corinthians 10. Verse number 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be, you should be ignorant. <laughs> How about all our fathers? How would you like to start off with a letter? Greetings from the Apostle Paul. Don't be ignorant. <laughs> I love the Bible, man. It just cuts through all the... Oh, how was your day? How was your croissant? Was it burnt? Do you like your coffee? How was your chamomile tea today? Don't be ignorant. That's what you get in this church. <laughs> That's funny right there. I don't care what you say, man. Moreover, brother, I would not that you should be ignorant. How that all the fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and, all, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of, uh, drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters as were some of them, as is written, the people sat down to eat, Drink, uh, and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted were destroyed as serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed as the story. Who would think fornication and idolatry would be lumped with murmuring? Now all these things happened, verse 11, unto them for in samples. So examples and examples are different. We looked at that before. And they are uh, written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Verse 12, wherefore let him that thinketh he sinneth take heed lest he fall. You know what you're not supposed to be ignorant of here in this passage? Don't be ignorant of the Old Testament not having any effect on your life. It, it goes right with what I just said. You're not Israel. You're not. You're not going to get uh, bread from heaven. You're not going to get quails three foot high. You're not going to have the Red Sea open. But don't tell me God doesn't do miracles for you in your life like that. But what do I do? I was just told, don't be ignorant by my apostle through the Holy Ghost. You ought to read that Old Testament. Well, I'm a New Testament Christian. You, 100%, there's no debating that. But to leave out Genesis to Malachi, you're missing some real good reading there about examples and examples. You heard this morning about the offerings. Those offerings are huge. Because they're fulfilled in Jesus Christ, but they're also su supposed to be fulfilled in my life. But what does Leviticus have to do with me doctrinally? Nothing. Practically, a lot. But who reads Leviticus? Who reads the book of Ruth? Who reads Esther? Who reads Chronicles? Some of you are looking at me going like, are those books in the Bible or is he playing with me right now? Is he messing with me or what? It would be a shame to get to home to glory and God goes, what do you think about the uh, similitudes I use in, uh, in Hosea 12? Why? You know, those things I wrote for you to learn about that I gave to my people through the prophets. Remember, remember that? Uh, uh, Lord, I'm a New Testament Christian. I'm a, yeah, I know. Arguing with the Lord about... I, I get it, man. I read the Old Testament. I re, I, you should read every word in this King James Bible. Every bit of it. Because every word of God is pure. And the stuff you think you don't get a blessing out of by reading, uh, you know, he begat, he begat, he begat, he begat, all of a sudden you come along and go, wow, I'm glad I'm begotten of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, I don't, I don't like reading those chronicles. Did you ever think you're in the register of God's registry? See, you, you think too carnal like I do, and you get ignorant. You get ignorant of things, you ignore it. I'm not going to read the Old Testament. Uh, folks, how many of you have lived your saved life like the nation of Israel? Out in the wilderness, come back to the Lord. Out in the wilderness, back to the Lord. Smite the rock when I'm supposed to speak to it. I need forgiveness. Lord, I committed adultery in my heart and my mind. Forgiveness. Lord, I stole. Would you forgive me? Lord, I've lied. That's why that stuff in that Old Testament is so poignant and so it's so... It's so good. The, oh, I'm not going to be bit by a fiery serpent. No, but your attitude might be like your old father, the devil, who's a red dragon. And you're after going to... You learn that stuff. How, come on, man. Are you telling me you've never murmured? You've never grumbled and complained about the way God did something in your life? Are you serious? Are you going to tell me, looking at me like that, that you've never murmured against your God once? 
well, that's the nation of Israel did that, and he wiped out a whole generation. Yeah, be careful. Your relationship with your heavenly father doesn't suffer because you're murmuring. How do I know that? There are in samples and examples. Read all that book, man. I know there's some chunks in the Old Testament that get really, I get it, man. But it's all there for my learning, and so I won't be ignorant. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. We're, we're moving quick now. We're, we're cooking with gas. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. The Bible says this, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. <laughs> I'm not going to reteach Sunday school. If you were here for that, praise the Lord. If not, go look it up and listen to it. But when God saved you, He gifted you. You know why some of you are not interested in this right now? Because your gift means you've got to give up your life and then use that gift to invest in somebody else's life. God didn't just give you the gift of eternal life. Yes, He did. But after He saved you, He gifted you with a gift from those lists in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. He gifted you with something. And that gift is to benefit other saved people. How many of you in here do not raise your hand? Just raise your hand, you know, meant, you know, spiritually. How many of you in here have ever asked the Lord, Lord, what is my gift? Lord, what did you give me when you saved me besides salvation that I might be able to benefit a brother and sister in the body of Christ? Because that's what the gifts are for. There is no gift of witnessing. We're all supposed to be witnesses. He's given every one of us the ministry of reconciliation. He's made us all able ministers of the New Testament. Witnessing is not a gift. Soul winning is not a gift. You were given a gift by the Holy Ghost to benefit somebody else in the body of Christ. Have you ever asked the Lord, what is my gift? If you haven't, you're ignorant. You know why I know you're ignorant? The first verse we just read. He's talking to Corinthian believers. You are ignorant that God gave you a spiritual gift. For years our church has taught, let's just be saved. Show up to church, give 10% so God doesn't wipe out your water heater. Or break your kid's arm or some other thing a blackmailer does or a, an extortioner or a, a hitman. That's weird, man. We'll, we'll, hit, we'll, we'll get, when the guys are done, we'll, we'll get into all, we'll have all kinds of good, fun storehouse tithing stuff. We'll also, but I mean, uh, uh, okay, now I lost, you see, I lost my train of thought. My, my train went off the track. Guido, you know what? You affected me. There's something in the pulpit right now. Okay, we were talking about the gifts, and uh, Justin, help me out here. You were good at rebuking me before. Now help me out, man. Only because I remember the previous message. Okay. Well, so as you're, as, as you're going through the gifts here, and you've been gifted, and we were taught... The train, the, the, the smoke's starting to come back out of the stack, man. That's weird that it happened. And Bert's not even, I can't even blame him today, man. It's his ghost. It's the familiar spirit floating around here, man. But we were taught in our churches, and I st it's still going on, that win them, win them, win them, and work them. Win them to Christ, dunk them in a the tank, and then just go to work. And they have no idea about their growth in Christ, their life in Christ, their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, how to get along with other Christians. Because you know what? Uh, we're not the most spectacular family to get along with. You need to learn how to take some blows and take some hatred and take some, you know, you, you got to learn because we can be unsavory to one towards another. I don't know if you know it. We bite and devour one another real well. We shouldn't, but we do. But what happens is we've taught them, you know, it's all about souls. Uh, we, do, we do go out and witness to people. But the church is not for lost people. The church is for saved people to be what? Perfected, work in the ministry, edifying the body of Christ. Church is for you to get strengthened, edified, and perfected to be more like Jesus Christ so you can go out and live that life in front of the lost world. But the gift you were given by Almighty God, don't be ignorant of this, was to help somebody else in the Lord. Help them with their walk in Jesus Christ. Because you know what? If you've got one gift or two gifts, you're missing the other 10 or 11. And what somebody else has that you don't, their gift can help you. And your gift can help them. That's the way, imagine if everybody was a preacher. Imagine if everybody had the gift of prophecy. Or everybody had the gift of helps and there was no prophecy. What if, what if there was no Bible teacher to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord. And, and just, oh, 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 Estella, you teach today. And, and Kathleen, you, we'll just go around. And whatever you want to teach. No, God raises up a teacher of the gifts to teach the congregation and assembly. We have some teachers in this place. That's a good thing. But that's not the major one. You've got to blend it in with the other gifts so you have a complete 
functioning assembly. He says right off the bat, guys, I don't want you to be ignorant. Have you ever asked the Lord what your gift is? Lord, what did you gift me with outside of salvation that I might use to benefit somebody else in the body of Christ? You know what that takes? It's not all about me, Justin. It's not all about, no, it's what can I do with what God gave me for somebody else? Sacrifice. We all quote Romans 12, 1 and 2, but living it, that's a whole different deal, man. A living sacrifice. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, the Bible says this in verse number 1. 2 Corinthians 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia, uh, Achaia. grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, God of all comfort. I know we've been here before. I don't, I don't know why we keep coming back, but that's okay. Who comfort us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead, who delivered us from so, great, uh, from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us, ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, uh, many persons thanks may be given by many on our behalf." You know what he said right in the middle of all that, what we read? He knows, I don't want you to be ignorant that trouble's coming your way. I'd, I'd like to say this is smooth sailing for you and I, but it's not going to be. Uh, doesn't for 2 Timothy 3.12 say, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer what? Even if it wasn't just the persecution, the Christian life, the saved life, is one full of troubles. Would you say, Paul, other than the time where he said, you know what, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to Jerusalem, and the Lord said, no, you're not. Can you think of any other time that the Apostle Paul was out of the will of God? Let's get even more pointed. Can you think of one time Jesus Christ was out of the will of God? Did he suffer trouble? He suffered trouble as an evildoer, and he did no evil. Folks, your saved life, I know it's going to bother some of you, your saved life is not all roses. It's some thorns. It's some pain and sorrow. You know what, since you've been saved, have you lost loved ones to death? Have you faced sicknesses and infirmities in your life? Have you had your car break down? Have you had trouble paying mortgages? Have you had water, water leaks in your house? Well, I thought I was saved. This is all, no, there no trouble. No, no eternal trouble. You just read it right there. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. This life of a saved person doesn't mean you're not going to have trouble. Doesn't mean you're never going to have a gut ache or run out of gas or struggle paying your bill. That's not it, man. Our promise and our joy is for the land that's coming, the new Jerusalem. But down here, friend, this life is full. Even Job said it. Man that is born of a woman is what? A few days and what? Full of trouble, man. That's what this life brings because of the effect of sin. Even as a saved person, sin still affects you and I. Whether it's sin from somebody else or sin in your own life, it brings sorrow and misery and woe. And you know what the Apostle Paul says? He says, don't be ignorant, man. You need to know that your life is going to be full of trouble. Even when you're quote-unquote living right, doesn't he chasten and scourge every son whom he receiveth, good, bad, or indifferent? He does that to every son. If he did it to his son, he's going to do it to you. We love the book of Job, but who wants to live that life? Funerals, housing collapses, market collapses, lose everything. Wife getting on you, which I can't blame her for doing that. You bury 10 kids and have all that, you'd be upset too. You would be. But we all like to talk about Job, but I mean, honestly, uh, that boy's life was full of trouble. You don't, you don't get until 41 chapters later, is it any better? 
Folks, don't be ignorant. You know, you know why I say this? Don't quit when hard times come. You, you're ignorant that they're not going to come. They're going to come. But usually when that first wave comes, okay, but when that second wave comes, and I'm telling you, folks, they're ignorant and they cash out and say, that's, uh, you know what, I, I, I'm just done. I'm done with it. Apostle Paul says to the Holy Ghost, don't be ignorant of that. Look at chapter number two with me. While you're right here, chapter number two, we've got a couple more. Chapter number two, we're doing, we're doing very good, man. It's going quicker than I, I mean, it might be like razor blades on your eyeballs, but it's, it's, it's doing, it's going well, man. Second Corinthians chapter number two, verse one says this. But I determined this with myself that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For I would make you sorry. Who is, he that ma uh, who is he then that maketh me glad? But the same which is made sorry by me. And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow of them, of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which is inflicted of many. So that contrary wise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps a one, uh, such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. He's talking about the man that committed fornication with his mom in 1 Corinthians 5. And what he's saying here is he goes, the Apostle Paul is saying, I know I made you sorry. I came at you guys hard. I rebuked you because I love you, but you can't let that sin in your camp. You've got to deal with it, and you're, you're carnal, and you're babies. You're not getting along and all that. So he's saying, now I'm writing to you again. I, I know what I did in the last one, the tears and all that. I get all that. But now he's coming to you saying, you know what? If that man repented, if that man turned, you take him back. He's not going to be in charge of ladies' night, but you know, <laughs> he's not going to have the young singles class, but bring him back in the congregation. But look what it goes on to say. Verse number 8 says, Wherefore I beseech you that you confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. I shouldn't have to say this this morning. I probably don't have to say it. But you have an adversary, and his name is the devil. Yes, you do have yourself, and yourself is left to its left on its own is pretty much a wreck. But I don't want to negate the fact you have an enemy out there. That enemy is the one that hates God, hates Jesus Christ, and by the way, hates Israel, and he hates you. He's not your buddy. I'm not playing devil's advocate. I have an advocate with the Father. His name's Jesus Christ. I'm not playing devil's advocate. I'm not on his side about anything. I hate him. I can't wait to see Jesus front kick him like Bruce Lee right into the lake of fire. That's not in the King James Bible. That's in this movie thing. I surprised. It's going to be slow-mo. Oh, and he's going to go back in this crazy dragon just spinning through. Sp I'll write it down. For I'll draw it up on the board. Right, right next to I didn't kill my wife. I'm going to do that, man. That's awesome, man. But we have an adversary named the devil. He walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking me to... That means there's victim, potential victims out there he's roaming around for. You know what lions typically do? They'll distract you in the front and there'll be one laying over here in the bush. And, you know, like I heard Dr. Peacock tell the story one time when they were over in Africa, their guide said, told these people... Specifically, do not get out of the vehicle. Do not get out of the vehicle. But you know what happens when you tell somebody, don't get out of the vehicle. I'm going to get out of the vehicle. Yeah. Well, this guy went over to take a picture of a lion that was, and he got out, and the guy screamed at him. And this happened within two to three minutes. There was a larger lion, lion in the brush and came out and took that guy snapping the photograph, and they all had to scramble to get out of there. That's what the devil does. Distract you and then devour you. Remember the story of that, uh, that, uh, the old prophet and the young man prophet in 1 Kings 13? What happened to that young man prophet when he didn't listen to the Lord but trusted that old man? It says the lion devoured him but left his ass alone. Killed the man but left the donkey. That's what the adversary wants to do. And you know what right here? 
The devil has weapons, you know. I don't want you to be ignorant that you have an adversary called the devil. I don't want you to be ignorant that he, he is your enemy and he hates you. He's not your buddy. He has no best interest for you at heart. He cannot do anything to your soul regarding eternal life, but he can sure mess your testimony up if you let him. But you know what you have to do to that clown? Just resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Trust in the Lord, your refuge, your God. But I, you need to know, don't be ignorant, he's out there. And you know what one of his weapons is in the context? What, uh, this little class participation. What's the weapon he uses in the context of 2 Corinthians 2? Unforgiveness. You know one of the ways that you and I are ignorant of? I can, you just heard in Sunday school, I can just let it go. There may be some time where you have to confront that person and say, you're wrong, brother. You're wrong, sister. And there has to be that forgiveness given between the parties. Because unforgiveness will destroy an assembly and destroy your life quicker than you can ever imagine. And the devil, your adversary, uses unforgiveness against you. It's no big deal. It's just unforgiveness. Who cares? Okay. Oh, he cares. That's one of his weapons in his arsenal. Oh, it's the big teeth and it's the claws. and it's a... No, it's unforgiveness. Oh, he's a great dragon. He takes a third of the stars and throws it. It's unforgiveness. Don't be ignorant, man. It's stuff like that that can ruin an assembly, can ruin your life, man. And the Apostle Paul through Logos says, you know what? You should, you should know this. You should know not to be unforgiving. But I have to bring it up and remind you because you're ignorant of it. I don't want you to be. First, that's, uh, actually, you know what? Let's skip ahead. Go to 2 Peter. Then we'll come back. 2 Peter. Then we'll come back. We have to end on a, on a, on a good note. 2 Peter. I mean, it's all been good notes. I just want to, you know, really have one crescendo good note. <laughs> 2 Peter chapter number 3. <laughs> See what fun you can have with the word ignorant, Brother Jonathan? Seems good stuff, man. I mean, come on. When somebody says, don't act ignorant, doesn't that bother you? You know, when somebody says, you're just ignorant, doesn't that like make you want to fight? Like, are you calling me like a rube? Do you see like a, 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 a gas peddling rag in my back pocket and my hat turned sideways and ripped? You think I work at the Stafford Speedway at night or something? I mean, what's, you know, <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't say, man. I, did, but I mean, that's the, you know, what, what are you, just a cop? What are you, an idiot? What are you, what are you just ignorant? Are you unlearned? Are you unschooled? Is that what it is? It just jabs you. But the Word of God's telling you not to be ignorant. The, God's saying, my kids should know what this stuff means and how to employ it in their life. Stop being unlearned about this. Stop being ignorant, brethren. It's not ignorant about Pythagorean theorem or ignorant about the how, you know, how many senators are there? How many? We're so wise in the stupid things of this world and we're ignorant of God's book. And you're saved. You know more about what's going on on TV than you do in the King James Bible. That's called ignorance. And you'll not escape at the judgment seat of Christ. Look at the Bible says to me, 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse 1. This second epistle, brethren, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may, uh, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fa uh, fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, in the water, we're not going to get into the gap this morning, the flood that happened, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished, but the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto, the fire, uh, unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Oh, what are you going to get out of this preacher? This is pretty, I mean, this is how we tell the, you know, right dispensational. This is how we lay out the four days and the three days. 100% correct. A day with the Lord has a thousand years, a thousand years. Well, that's a phenomenal passage. But you know what he wants you not to be ignorant of? God's timing is not your timing. A thousand years? I ain't, I ain't been a thousand. There's nobody that's ever lived a thousand years. Methuselah lived 969. Guido's close. But I mean, I mean, there's only, I mean, there's one man made 969, but nobody's ever lived to even be a thousand years old. I mean, that's a long time. And the Lord's like, yeah, you don't count time like I count. But Lord, don't you want to fix me now? Yeah, give me three or five years to work on that. But Lord, I want to know the Bible now like that. Nah, it's going to take you 10, 20 years. But Lord, I want to preach right now. Yeah, you may have to sit for a while and learn how to be humble. But Lord, I want... 
God's timing is not our timing. But I'm glad for that. Because if He gave me everything I wanted, every time I want, every instance I want, I'd be a spoiled brat. I'd rather live by His wisdom and His timing than mine. Because you know what? My timing's got me in debt. Heartbreak, anger, bitterness. God says, you know what? Why don't you trust my timing? Because I look at a day as a thousand years, a thousand years a day. Why don't you just trust me to span this thing out the way that I see fit? I mean, you've trusted Him for all eternity with your soul. You can certainly trust Him for 60, 70, 80 years down here, can't you? I, it's easy to say. It's hard to do. But that's only because your old flesh likes to take the steering wheel back. You know the God is my co-pilot thing? No, God is your car. He's your brake lines. He's your gas tank. He's your pilot. He's your anchor. He's everything. God's my co-pilot. What do you think God would have said yesterday, Paul, when we got pulled over on the side of the road, man? You got to be like, oh, but you don't have to say anything about it, man. I had a chance to witness to a trooper yesterday. No. Oh, man. Romans 13 is still not in my Bible. I wasn't going that fast. Yeah. <laughs> $200 worth is pretty fast. He's stupid. But he had mercy on me, so. He did. He was very kind. You know, what are you going to do, man? I did. I got, I got, I got a ticket yesterday. That's the first one in what? Like four days? No. <laughs> that's, that's like five, six years. That's, that's, that's a record for me now. <laughs> I can count the amount of tickets. I shouldn't have any. That's the reality of it. You shouldn't have any. Stop acting like a jerk. I've been driving since 19... I'm just telling you right now before we get it out because Paulie's been dying to tell this whole thing. I'm like, I got him now. But I've been driving since 83. 1983. I think, yeah, I've got, I've got under 10 tickets. But it's when you get them, you're like... Yeah. But anyway, so... What that had to do with the message, I don't know. But Brother Jonathan's smiling right now. He's like, yeah, man. I know. <laughs> I, what's it? Were you behind me on uh, 84? Oh, today for good, you didn't see it. There's only one witness and he's going to die. But he, he, squealed, he squealed like a pig to his woman, like a stool pigeon. What's that? She's like, he's not going that fast. I wasn't. No, but this idiot with a New York license plate, Beelzebub, was in front of me. I'm like, I went, I went no, I'm like, I'm, no, I'm doing my, I'm doing my, I don't know, I'm like. So I just pulled out and kind of accelerated and. And he's in the spot that I know he's going to be at. That's the worst part. That's where he's... I know where he's sitting at. No, the triangle. We'll talk about it tonight, yeah. Right, right before 67, then he's like... I said, Paul, he's got me. Paul's like, no, he ain't got you, man. I said, he's got me, man. There ain't no question about it. <laughs> anyway, what that has to do with this... Anyway, God's timing is not our, is not our timing. <laughs> I just think of all the tickets I should have got. Brother Guido will tell you a story about that one time. Going one mile over the speed limit. And that's, he said, yeah, man. But anyway, off the speed limit thing for a minute. God's timing is not my timing. I can't be ignorant of that. I, I don't, I can't trust myself with this thing. God lets it play out the way God lets it play out. If he's in control of everything, that, brother, that message by Brother Gip that time where he stood in the pulpit and he, had that, he took the piece of paper and he held it like this and he walked to one side of the, the, one side of the stage in the first Bible and he worked, you know how big that stage is and he walked to the other side and he goes, this is where you are in a sheet of paper in God's time. And I was like, that's it. But I don't think like that. I want it to be, because I can go to the food window and get my food. I get, I get, everything's now, 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 now. It's microwave. Let's do it, let's do it. God's like, no, I look at a day as like a thousand years. I mean, could you wait? Could you wait? It'll be right when you wait and do it in my timing, not yours. Last one, 1 Thessalonians. That ticket thing, that's hilarious, man. Wow, stupid, man. Wow, what an idiot, man. He actually asked me, he said, do you know, do you know a guy named Jonathan Benoit? I said, I sure do. He goes, his picture's up, his picture's up in our jail, you know. I <laughs> said, Nah, that's what I was going to say, man. He was talking faster than I read my Bible. I was like, he was like, blah, 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 speed. I was like, okay. And, and I actually, Paul and I said, I, I said, excuse me, sir? And he goes, I said, I'll, blah, 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 speed. And then and he went back, he came out with a ticket. He was, 
I, I wish he was. Your prayer life gets real good when you see the blue and red, man. <laughs> Father, please, I'll never do it again. I probably never <laughs> Stupid, man. First Thessalonians 4. First Thessalonians 4. We all have our weak spots. That driving is, Brother Guido will tell you, driving is not a, that's not a spirit-filled experience, man. First Thessalonians 4. Bible says this is verse number 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That, that means we don't go up before the dead in Christ. Prevent. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's finish up with this, man. Don't be ignorant, folks. We're getting out of here one day. I, you say that's, that's stupid. We shouldn't say that. No, you ought to be reminded about the cross every once in a while. And you ought to be remembered about our blessed hope that's coming for us in the clouds. Folks, it doesn't, it's not always going to go this way with gas. And all that. Don't get caught up in that, man. Look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Don't be ignorant, brethren. Our Savior is coming for us. You should know that. You should live it like it's every day, every minute. Amen. Brother Paul Riando, pray for us, please. And we are done for the, the morning. Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen. Amen.